Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you here this morning. How are you? Great. <laughs> well, it's good to be here. And whether you are a member of this church or you're joining us here for the first time, welcome to First United Methodist Church, Midlothian. I'm April Failer, and Brady Johnson is sitting right there in the front row. We are your pastors here at church. And for those of you who are joining us online, feel free uh, to say hello to each other. Let us know that you're here. And if you'd like us to pray for you or get in contact with you, please leave a message um, so that we can uh, pray for you if that is something that you need us to do. This week is the third week of Advent, which represents joy. And this week, Deborah Keyes will be reading the scripture from Isaiah 35:10. So Deborah Keyes, would you please come forward? Deborah and her husband will be reading. Roger. The Advent scripture for this Sunday comes from Isaiah 35, 10, and it reads, and those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. We light this candle as a symbol of Christ our joy. May the joyful promise of your presence, O God, make us rejoice in our hope of salvation. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Amen. So as we together gather together right now, whether it is a person or gathered around a screen, it's at this moment that I ask you to lay all of your concerns and your worries and your fears aside, because you are in a place to begin worship, which means you should come into this place ready and expecting to experience the presence of God. So let us begin our worship this morning. Good morning, church. Let us stand and sing. Angels we have heard on high.
Let's affirm our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. Let us bow in prayer together. Jesus, Hebrews chapter 1 reminds us that you are the light of God's glory, the very imprint of his being, that you sustain and keep all of creation by your powerful word. You have won the cleansing of your people and sat down at the right hand of God, your Father. We come to remember these words because they are words that, that give us the meaning of the power and authority that you have. You indeed are filled with glory. The whole earth is filled with your glory. And so we sit here and worship in awe of who you are. We sit here humbled by all that you have done for us. 
And though you occupy such a place of glory, we do not forget that you came to be born in the most humble of circumstances among us. You were born, as the hymn says, that we may no more die. We thank you, Jesus, for the salvation and life that you give us, an eternal life not only in, in quantity but also in quality. You set joy before us and you fill us with hope. Even in the midst of the trials and the troubles of this life, you lift us up. And we thank you for the victory you enable us to live with in this world. And we pray that, that we might today, because of who we are in you, live in the fullness of that victory. We pray you release us from that which troubles us, from the things that consume us and dominate our minds and rob us of our joy. Would you grant us peace? Would you fill us again with the power of your promises? And by your grace, May you give us the strength needed for this day and for tomorrow. We come here, Jesus, praising you in the midst of the season in which we fall before you. And we pray that you would draw us together as a church and lead us deeper into the mystery of the Advent season. We love you and we pray this in your great and holy name. And we are mindful as your disciples of the way in which you have taught us how to live, the way in which you have, have laid before us and you have taught us how to love, how to forgive, how to pray. And so we end this prayer by following that which you have given to us in saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
when you kiss your little baby you've kissed the face of god the blind will see the deaf will hear the dead will live again the lame will leap the dumb will speak the praises of the Lamb. Mary, did you know that your baby boy is Lord of all creation? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will one day rule the nations did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb this sleeping child you're holding is the great Thank you, Joe, for that. We continue with our, our sermon series, looking at um, some of the most powerful songs that we've seen during this season. Songs that move us, songs that inform us on the context of Christmas, that take us into that story of Christmas that, that points us in the direction of what that message really is from different perspectives. And this time, we get to talk about it from the shepherd's perspective. So our scripture, scripture this morning is Luke 2, 8 through 20, and it reads, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appear with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. The Mary treasured all up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen which were just as they had been told. 
Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. One of the things that I enjoy doing is going to museums to understand our past a little bit and the different things that that happen in different contexts. I like understanding people and places and things and understanding the history of it. I'm just fascinated by it. So one of the places that I have visited a number of times is the Holocaust Museum. And for me, it, it provides an understanding of, of what happens when um, you know, people get in places where, where things get a little bit hopeless. You know, how do they find their, their way out? How do they deal with such harsh conditions? And so part of this was me trying to figure out what's going on. And so I'll go with colleagues, or I'll take students, or I'll, I, I will visit the Holocaust Museum a number of times um, throughout the last several years. I'd say I, I, in the last 10 years, I probably visited the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC about four times, sometimes with colleagues or students. Now, the first two times I went, I was devastated by the details they showed. And I don't have to go into details about that. You can imagine the kinds of things and the terror and the hate that you see there. The nightmare of the Jewish people lived there at the time is beyond my understanding. But it leaves an impression on you. It makes you step back and realize that this is not only horrible and unforgettable, and it's supposed to be unforgettable, so that we're less likely to do it again. But then the third time that I went, things changed. I began to see slivers of hope in the darkest of places. I saw one neighborhood over in the corner of all the exhibits where the people there were actually able to drive the Nazis back out of their neighborhood and kept them out somehow. And then in the other corner, I was able to see a family, primarily the head of the household, and he found a way to hide three different families in the walls of his house. And he did so successfully. Those three families survived the war and lived to tell about it. Now, these are amazing times of hope. These were shining, uh, you know, much brighter than the devastation that I'd always seen. I began to see the hope and the sacrifices people were willing to make. I started to learn that maybe it's not what I saw that mattered, but what I paid attention to that mattered most and, and why. So I started thinking about, you know, what's the difference between the second and the third? Why did I suddenly, in the third time around, start noticing the hope and start noticing the, the peace of mind and, and how people connected in community at that time? You know, why was it different between the second and the third? Because the exhibits were the same. The testimonies were the same. The videos were the same. The only difference was the condition of my heart between the second and the third visit. Between the second and third visit, I had just gone through a divorce to a man who had become an atheist in my 10-year marriage. And in between those two visits, my eyes had been opened and my perspective shifted as I began to lean into my faith without restrictions that were placed on me at that time. I began to invite God into all of life's matters, including what I saw in that museum. Because as I sat there and watched some of the, the most gruesome experiments and the, the worst terror of, that people could experience, especially with the children that were involved in all of this, you can't help but go, why God? But instead of asking why, I said, yeah, join me in this. Walk me in this. Help me see what we've done. Help me understand what I need to do to keep this from happening again. The grace of God had just begun to shape who I was from the inside out. And because of that, I could see where grace was at work and those whose faith saved the Jews in some of the testimonies I had read. So you see, joy 
is when your heart is changed by your focused faith, your avid trust in God, and by receiving the gift of grace, so much so that you can see God's grace working all around you, even in the darkest corners, you know, those places inside us we don't like showing other people. Joy has a way of bringing light to even those places. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that we don't deal with suffering and trial. That's not it at all. But what happens is that when you start seeing grace at work in others, you start seeing the extraordinary in the ordinary. And though you face these trials and sufferings, just like we all do with joy, you're quicker to pick up on signs of grace than others are. You can move through these darker times maybe a little more quickly, maybe a little more effectively. So let's look into the moment between the ordinary and extraordinary of the shepherds that day. Let's see what changed them from the inside out, so much so that they left their usual path behind to go find a king that would change their world as much as they themselves would be changed in a simple moment in time. So if you knew what was going on in that point in time when Jesus was born, you would know that the world was steeped in sin. Because after all, there's a reason why God came into flesh and lived among us. The corruption and the hunger for power was everywhere. In their worship spaces, in their marketplaces, and in their government. There was no room for hope. There was no room for grace because it had been so long since the ordinary was anything more than unresolved brokenness. And when you've been in that darkness and in those shadows for so long, you forget that it can be anything else. And even though it becomes heavy and really hard to breathe in those circumstances, it's everywhere and it becomes all that you know. And I think the shepherds may have known that more than any of the rest of us because the shepherds were the outcasts. They were the ones that, that really didn't belong in society, so they took care of the dirtiest jobs, right? They weren't welcome in most communities, except, of course, to serve the purposes that they were hired for to take care of the sheep. So they were used to living in the shadow of others. They were the least likely to be chosen to receive a message from God and even less likely to share it successfully with others in the community itself. And yet, God chose them, the least of these, to make way for Christ's ministry. So one night as they sat under the ordinary quiet sky, the shepherds were blinded by this heavenly light of angels, the likes of which they'd never seen before. And, and with it came an extraordinary message of grace, the gift of a baby who will change everything, not just for the ones in town or the ones leading temple or the ones in government offices, but this tiny baby will change it all by the grace of God. So in that moment, the ordinary became extraordinary for the shepherds as the promise of a renewed world began in a way opposite of what they expected in the form of a baby who will change the world for the better. So these shepherds began to see that the darkness and the brokenness could be overcome not only at their first glimpse of grace with these angels that were singing on top of them in the sky, but eventually they were also convinced of this grace when they saw the small child in the manger, that what God's messenger said was true. And that grace began to change their hearts as joy settled in. And it was this joy that strengthened and propelled them forward to proclaim the message of the arrival of the Christ child across the land. 
So Hark the Herald Angels Sing, this hymn was meant to highlight some very powerful, hope-filled, grace-filled, joy-inspiring messages to all that are lost like the shepherds, who are searching like the shepherds did, who needed reassurance that they weren't walking in this world alone. God is still with them. So when singing this song, it's meant to be sung out loud, proclaiming what the angels already knew and what we already know, that God has sent his son to right the wrongs, to bring forgiveness back to a world that hadn't seen forgiveness and only God knows how long, to give the grace that they hadn't seen before, to love the unloved that had not known it, and only God knows how long, and to show mercy in a place that I hadn't seen it, for only God knows how long. So now it's in this song, the power of Jesus Christ to do things the world needed him to do. They were all spelled out basically by calling out Christ's name. Each time they called out his name, they used a different label. And each one of those labels connected with a purpose that he served. And so anytime we, we sing this kind of song, you've got to belt it out because the name talks about who he was and what he could do. And so one of those names was Everlasting Lord. And what this did was when they called Everlasting Lord, it was to remind the singers that God will never leave us behind and is big enough to overcome all problems. Now I'm going to ask you to do something for me right now. That's not Everlasting Lord. You say it like you mean it, and I'm going to ask the choir to do this as well. I need you to say it like you mean it. Let's invite the Everlasting Lord here, down, now. Everlasting Lord, say it. Everlasting, Everlasting Lord. Lord, say it. Everlasting Lord. That's the cry out that when you sing this song, you are inviting Everlasting Lord in here. Now, you already know that that's what the Lord is, that the Lord is indeed everlasting, always present, always there, always active. But back in those days, there were questions, which is why this song brings that into focus to celebrate what we already know, but they didn't. Another one, Emmanuel. 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 What does that mean, choir? God, God is with us. So back then, when they thought God was gone, that God had forgotten them, that God couldn't possibly part of this again, and the only people that knew at that moment were the shepherds. They needed a reminder, so they called out in this in this song, Emmanuel. Say it, Emmanuel. Say it. Emmanuel, mean it, Emmanuel. They were calling out in this song to make sure we knew that God was still walking with us. And then with all the corruption and the anger that was going on around Jesus' time, Prince of Peace is also in this song. So when the Prince of Peace is called out, we were calling out someone who could rewrite the wrongs, rewrite what we needed to think about, what we needed to do about things, and get rid of the traditions that were made by men to benefit certain people over others. That peace came from within. That peace that passes all understanding could only come from Jesus Christ our Lord. So when we call out Prince of Peace in this song, we want to be reminded that peace will never leave their grasp as long as they are faithful. So say it, Prince of Peace. Prince, Prince of peace. peace. Prince of Peace. How many of y'all want peace this holiday? How many of you want peace this holiday? See, we got one person going, yeah. How many of you want peace this holiday? Peace, Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. Invite God into being the Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. She's like, what? So these are the things. Well, I got one more I'll call out because, you know, sometimes we just need to be righted. We need to be brought into this space. Our sins have taken us a little off course. And for those of you who may go to the right, let me do it on the other side too. We may flow a little to the left. So we're off course. We have to be reminded that that can be a forgivable sin, always forgivable. So what we have here is the son of righteousness, that we can be forgiven for those sins because Christ is the son of righteousness. So son of righteousness, son of righteousness. 
son of righteousness, son of righteousness. We have to be reminded that our, our sins can be forgivable, but we have to be ready to let go and let God. We've got to be ready with our sins, face those sins, and what do we must do to sin? What is it that we must do? Ask for forgiveness. Ask for forgiveness. We've got to be ready to what? Repent. 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 Thank you very much. <laughs> if, if we couldn't get that next word out, I don't know what I was going to do. But the point of all of this is, these are powerful words. Calling out these words and inviting God out, and inviting God in to what we are doing, inviting God into our lives in every event that we walk into is powerful. Because with these words, we are calling and inviting God in to our lives for specific reasons. And that's what this song does. It celebrates our faith. It reminds us of how powerful our God is, so much so that he's willing to give up his son's life for us, how much he loves us, how dedicated he is. And over all else, we've got to have the power to call and invite Christ in by name when it is time. You've got to be aware of what we need and what is missing and invite God in by name. It was as if this song was the one the angels sung as they looked down upon the lost shepherds that night. The song opened the heavens so that the least of these will come to know the message of hope, of grace, and of joy at the birth of the new Messiah. And I pray that we can still see the extraordinary in the angels' message they shared with the shepherds that night. So extraordinary, in fact, that our hearts will continue to be changed by it each time we call out his name. Let us pray. Lord, we are finding our way to you one step at a time. Like shepherds, make your good news message known to us when we need it most. Open our eyes and our ears so that we can receive your grace and see it in others. Help us to change our hearts and come to know a life filled with joy. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, let's stand together as we sing Infant Holy, Infant Lowly. I have a few announcements I just wanted to share with you. We, um, we had a Christmas adventure um, this past week, and 
Um, we served about 450 people in this drive-through event that we did. And we had people that, there were three different lines of cars trying to poke in, you know, put themselves inside of our parking lot. And sometimes it took up to an hour for them to get in off the road and come all the way through what we did. And they waited gladly and were excited to be able to make it through. This was a wonderful opportunity for us to reach out and the community came. They needed the connection. So this is a wonderful thing. Um, it, it was amazing to be able to be part of that. Note that charge conference has actually changed dates. It's December 21st at 7 p.m. So know that that has changed. We have a caroling opportunity at Midtown across the way um, at the, in, in our parking lot about 5.30 p.m. on the 16th, right? Wednesday, 16th. So make sure that if you're wanting to do some caroling this year, this will be a great opportunity to do that. Sheep Trails is still going on as well. So check Facebook for this. We also have a, a sing-along this evening on Facebook Live. So check out our Facebook page at 5 p.m. Um, note that this year, as other years, our staff has been working feverishly. Sometimes we don't always see it because it's behind the scenes and we're online, but know this. Whenever things uh, change, as much as they have under COVID, the, the, the staff are stepping up to the plate and doing amazing things. And so I would like to invite you, if you feel so led, to uh, support the staff and bonuses this year. And so all you'd have to do is if you are providing a donation, just make sure that you notate that it's, it's staff bonuses in the memo so that we'll know exactly where that needs to go to support them and all the things they've accomplished within the year of COVID. And last uh, announcement that I have is that Christmas Eve will be online this year. And so uh, also note, so all, our service for Christmas Eve will be online only. And the week of Christmas, there will be resources available so that you can join us in our online celebration of Christmas Eve. And so now, know that I pray that you take the time to pay attention to the ordinary, to find a glimpse of the extraordinary in this holiday season. Take the time to not just be thankful for the grace of God, but to allow yourself to be changed by it, because it's that change of heart that brings the joy of the season. I say that in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Have a blessed week. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept their watching or signs. Tell it on the mountain.